June 23, 2023. A 46-year-old woman assaulted a Texas police officer with a hammer after cutting the wires connected to her building's fire alarm system. While this earned her the title of a Karen, what happened next changed the course of her life forever. Here are 10 Karens who messed with the wrong killers. Number 10. Rena James July 4, 2022. Rena James killed herself while trying to explode a neighbor's apartment with petrol. Miss Rena lived in a shared apartment complex in Bedford, UK, but never got along with her neighbors. She never really bothered until the lockdown in 2020 when she was forced to work from home. Rena complained to the management company about the neighbor who, she said, put her washing machine on, exercised early in the morning, and shouted at her children. When the management company didn't do anything about it, she complained to the police, counselors, and even told her landlord about those problems, yet it seemed like she wasn't making any sense. Seeing that no one was ready to deal with these disturbing neighbors, Miss Rena James decided to deal with them herself. At 9.45 a.m. on said day, Miss Rena poured a gallon of petrol into the apartment right above her, with the intention of burning everything they owned to the ground. She broke the locks on the apartment with a hammer, and when she was done pouring petrol everywhere, she lit a flame and threw it in. But what she didn't know is the flame would blow out of proportion, burning down half of the three-story building. The explosions were so loud, reports say it could be heard from half a mile away. Residents of the building were forced to jump through the windows for safety, and a couple of them sustained brutal and life-threatening injuries. As for Miss Rena James, or should I say Karen, she died not from the explosion but from a combination of head and chest injuries. According to reports, Miss Rena resided on the ground floor. The apartment she set on fire was right above her, and following that ignition, the force of the combustion pushed her all the way down to the ground, where she cracked her skull and broke her ribs. However, she didn't die immediately. A neighbor was able to drag her semi-conscious body away from the flames and collapsing building. But before medics could arrive, she was already dead. She wasn't drunk or high or anything. She just wanted to kill her neighbors, but she died instead. Number 9. Justine Damon July 15, 2017 40-year-old Australian-American Justine Damon was fatally shot by Minneapolis Police Department officer Mohammed Noor after Justine made a 911 call to report an incident in her neighborhood. That was the version told all over the news, but it was far from the reality that actually took place on that fateful day. Born on April 4, 1977, Justine grew up in the Northern Beaches area of Sydney, New South Wales, and attended Manly High School. She graduated in 2002 from the University of Sydney as a veterinarian, and then worked as a spiritual healer and meditation coach. She would move to Minneapolis in 2017 with her husband. And two months later, she died from becoming a Karen. On the day of the incident, she called 911 twice, at 11.27 p.m. and again at 11.35 p.m. During the first call, she tells the 911 operator, I can hear someone out the back and I'm not sure if she's having sex or being raped. I think she just yelled out help, but it's difficult. The sound has been going on for a little while, but I think, I don't think she's enjoying it. I think it's, I don't know. The operator got her details and told Justine a few policemen would be dispatched to the address. Now here's the twist. Dispatchers categorized the call as a relatively low priority. Justine would call back a few minutes later, persisting that the noises were getting louder. But the dispatcher still assured her that the cops were on their way. Two officers, Mohammed Noor and Matthew Harity, responded to the call and went down to the given address but found no signs of anyone having sex or being raped, as Justine claimed on the call. And as they're preparing to leave, Justine would storm out of her house, yell at the cops in her pajamas while barefoot, and dash towards the window of their car. This is where things kind of get messed up. Officer Harity pulled out his gun, pointed it toward her, in fear that she was about to attack him, while Officer Noor pulled out his gun and shot a harmless Justine in the abdomen. They tried everything they could, but Justine died 20 minutes later. Regardless of whether that 911 call was genuine, we can't deny the fact that this officer's decision to shoot was unreasonable. The case sent shockwaves around the U.S., fueling the narrative of police brutality. But two years later, Officer Knorr was sentenced to 12 and a half years in prison on charges of third-degree murder and second-degree manslaughter. Number 8. Kaylin Gillis 
April 15, 2023. 20-year-old Kalen Gillis was fatally shot by a 65-year-old man, Kevin Monahan, after the two got into an argument in a New York neighborhood. Gillis, a graduate from Schuylerville High School in New York, held the position of flyer on the school's cheerleading team. As you might imagine, she was pretty popular on and off campus, especially owning the fact that she was dating one of the coolest guys in school, Blake Walsh. Now on the day of the incident, Kaylin and her boyfriend Blake and two other friends were in a car headed to a party in the rural part of New York. They made a wrong turn, ending up in a ghetto neighborhood where Kaylin's killer Kevin Monahan was seated on his front porch. They didn't have phone service, so they couldn't tell if they were at the right address. But anyway, they stopped in front of Mr. Kevin's house. Kalen got into a little argument with him, and he dragged out his gun to shoot at him. Before Blake could make a getaway, two bullets had hit her torso, and she died before they could get any medical assistance. When asked why he shot at him, Mr. Kevin had a very different story to tell. According to his version of the story, there were many cars and motorcycles pulling up to his front yard, revving their engines and playing loud music. Then he had this little altercation with the group before firing his shots to scare him away. Both stories are quite similar, but Kalen's boyfriend left out the fact that there were a lot of cars en route to this party. Authorities were able to confirm that a car with two passengers, a car with four passengers, including Gillis and her boyfriend, and a motorcycle actually drove around this neighborhood. Plus, he fired those shots when they were already driving away and had no idea it hit anyone. But whether or not he intended to shoot Kalen, that's not for me to decide. Mr. Kevin was eventually charged with second-degree murder. He was forcefully arrested a few hours after the incident and remained in jail until his bail was posted. As for Gillis's family, a GoFundMe account was opened to aid them in the funeral arrangements. So far, up to $147,000 has been raised. It's pretty impressive, and as a way to say thanks to the people who showed him love in such a time, they released a statement that read, She was a big sister, much loved daughter, devoted friend, and partner to her loving boyfriend. She was just beginning to find her way in the world with kindness, humor, and love. Number 7. Melissa Perez June 23, 2023. Three cops from Texas would shoot and kill a 46-year-old woman named Melissa Perez after she had a mental breakdown in front of her home. Around 2 a.m. on the said day, police got a call from a San Antonio neighborhood about Melissa cutting the wires connected to the building's fire alarm system. At first, the local firefighters would come down to interrogate her on her actions, but when it was leading nowhere, the police were called. Three officers, Sergeant Alfred Flores, Eleazar Alejandro, and Nathaniel Villalobos, came down to the scene to address this situation. However, when they tried getting her into the patrol vehicle, Melissa turned her back on them and ran into her apartment. They followed behind and tried interrogating her through a window. Keep in mind, at this point, everything was still under control. However, when one officer tried opening the screen door from the window, Melissa, holding a glass candle, threw it towards him. It missed him by a little bit, and that was the moment things got heated. They ordered her to step out of that apartment, but she was refusing. And now she had a hammer, throwing it again towards the open window, shattering the glass protecting it. At this point, one of the officers fired shots at her, but he missed. Melissa then went and picked up that hammer and attempted to hit the officer, leading to all three of them firing shots and killing her at the scene. After the shooting, all three of them forced their way into the apartment to provide medical aid, but she was already dead. In a turn of events, all three were charged with murder, and they lost their jobs. They were also arrested with that bail set at a whopping $100,000. They made bail, but now we await their trial to see what happens to them next. Number 6. Nicholas Bryan Sometimes men can be Karens too. One example would be Nicholas Bryan, who was killed after using racial slurs on two African Americans. Born January 14, 1992, in Griffin, Georgia, Bryan worked in the metal industry in his family farm. He was a father who took good care of his family and was a pretty chill guy until the incident that led to his death. October 31, 2019, Bryan used racial slurs at three black men in a Waffle House before he was asked to leave by staff. However, Brian refused, leading to a fight between all three men. During the physical altercation, shots rang out and Brian was the one bleeding. 
The cops arrived at the scene and the two men involved, Robert Lewis Henderson and Antonio DeMarty Evans, were arrested. Some people in the area believed they shouldn't have been charged with murder, given the fact that Brian had called him the N-word and started this physical altercation. But none of this mattered in the face of justice, as Lewis Henderson, the one who fired the shot, was found guilty of voluntary manslaughter. But we've got to say, the trial was one of the most intense ever seen in the state. Henderson is the son of a Butts County commissioner, and the deceased Brian was related to a Butts County judge, so both sides did all they could to sway the jury in their favor and win this case. Witnesses and surveillance footage from various cameras both inside and outside the restaurant and body cam footage from the first deputies to arrive on the scene were played in court. And after all was played, a clearer picture of what happened that day was shown to the court. Apparently, Brian actually threatened to kill Henderson's wife, who was present at the scene with him. And it was Henderson who called the cops. But before they could arrive, Brian pushed Henderson into this physical fight leading to his death. He was found guilty, yes, but he might get the minimum sentence. Number 5. Brianna Workman December 28, 2022, Brianna Workman, a 32-year-old woman from Portland, shoved a child onto the train tracks while her mother stood right beside her. The child and her mom were standing at the Gateway Transit Center Max Platform in Northeast Portland, Oregon, when Brianna, who was seated, suddenly stood up and pushed the child onto the train tracks. The mother looked back in disbelief, while men around hurriedly tried to retrieve the child before that train arrived. Now, Brianna is known around town as a homeless native and was arrested the same day. She was given attempted assault in the first degree, assault in the third degree, interfering with public transportation, disorderly conduct in the second degree, and recklessly endangering another person. Now, what's crazy here is that Brianna had been arrested many times for other crimes, but never really got charged with any of them. And the wonderful person responsible for this is woke Democratic Mayor Ted Wheeler. Homelessness has become increasingly pervasive in Portland. Despite decades of liberal governance, locals are witnessing a potential shift due to the rising levels of crime, drug abuse, and homelessness, which have left the city in a state of disarray, just like the case of Brianna and that innocent child. Civil unrest about homelessness and crime in Portland has escalated following the deaths of George Floyd and Brianna Taylor. The streets are now plagued by litter, overwhelmed by tent cities. To put into context how crazy things have become, in less than three years, over 3,000 people are now living on the streets with at least 700 encampments within an area of less than 150 square miles. And the odds say there are many more like Brianna out there. People with nothing to lose and everything to gain by endangering the residents of this once great city. Number 4. Christopher Williams July 2017, 32-year-old Williams was enjoying a game of pool with an African-American man named Steven Spencer at the Pittston Bar. However, a dispute broke out during the game. In a bid to settle things down, Spencer extended his arm for a handshake, but Williams declined. This led to a bigger fight, where Williams showcased his inner Karen by verbally throwing those racial slurs at Spencer. That situation escalated, and Spencer fired a shot that hit and killed Williams, who was unarmed at the time. Everything happened so fast, and Spencer was saddled with the guilt that he had just killed a white man. He immediately turned himself in and was subsequently charged with criminal homicide, simple assault, and terroristic threats. But here's the good part. After more than a year on trial, a jury acquitted Spencer of all charges. He was freed after being held in jail for almost 15 months. And if you're wondering why he was set free, well, at his trial, Spencer testified that he acted in self-defense, emphasizing that he had endured racial taunts inside the bar that night before leaving. According to his account, a group of white men followed him outside, threatening him with racial slurs like, We gon' get you, nerd. Feeling his life was in danger, he drew his firearm and fired a single shot. While it could be a debatable reason to use his gun, Spencer's prosecutors weren't willing to let him go just like that. They contended that Spencer's actions were unrelated to the earlier bar fight and argued that he should have chosen to flee instead of using his weapon. But in this unusual turn of events, the court ruled in favor of Spencer, who's black, and acquitted him. That's definitely not the type of thing we get to see every day. 
However, his freedom is partly due to the fact that during his trial, he was portrayed as a family man and a business owner. It was also revealed that he had a gun permit and had no prior criminal record. And when he got out of court, he expressed his happiness by saying, I fought my life for 15 months, and I finally achieved justice. Number 3. Dylan Roof As we've seen, Karens can sometimes be men, and these Karens might also be the killers themselves. June 17, 2015, 21-year-old Dylan Roof spent an hour in Bible study with churchgoers before he brought out his gun and started a merciless shooting, killing nine black people in the process. The journey to this despicable incident began after Roof's uncle got him a 45 cal handgun as a 21st birthday gift in April of said year. Now add to the fact that his online posts also indicated a disturbing interest in white supremacy. You see, Roof's Facebook page showed a picture of him wearing a jacket with flags from apartheid era South Africa and Zimbabwe, places once ruled by the white men. Surprisingly, many of his Facebook friends were black. The tragedy unfolded shortly after Roof joined a Bible study group at the historic Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina. Out of nowhere, Roof would start shooting, reloading five times despite pleas for him to stop. Roof's chilling words were heard by a survivor. I have to do it. You rape our women and you're taking over our country. Another crazy part to this is Roof had been arrested twice that year for a drug offense and trespassing at a shopping mall. Additionally, there were no records of him graduating from high school in two school districts he attended. And during the incident, he brutally killed nine people, leaving about five others injured. After this incident, he ran away, but was eventually caught after a 14-hour manhunt. And to be honest, this is beyond being a Karen or a supremacist. This is being plain evil. Who would carry a gun to church? I mean, what punishment do you believe befits a person like Dylan? While we leave that for you to decide in the comments section below, the US Attorney's Office initially wanted to charge him with a hate crime driven by racial or other prejudices, typically earning him the death penalty. But in a state like South Carolina, that wouldn't have been possible. But these guys still found a way to nail him to a cross. January 11, 2017, Dylan Roof was officially sentenced to death. Number 2. Carolyn Bryant <sighs> Carolyn's arguably one of the first known Karens in history. Her false accusations led to the brutal murder of Emmett Till, a black teenager whose death shook the entire U.S. and galvanized civil rights movements back in the 50s. Let me explain. In 1955, Emmett Till was visiting family in Mississippi when he was accused by Carolyn Bryant Donham, who was 21 at the time, of making inappropriate remarks and grabbing her in a grocery store. A few days later, Till was forcibly taken at gunpoint by two white men, with evidence suggesting that a woman believed to be Carolyn Donham identified Till to him. The attacker subjected Till to a brutal beating and then dragged him to a river where they would shoot him in the head. To further desecrate his body, they used barbed wire to attach it to a large metal fan before dumping both into the river. Emmett Till's horribly disfigured body was discovered days later. Then in this powerful act of courage, his mother, Mammy Till Mobley, chose to leave Emmett's casket open during his funeral in Chicago, allowing the world to witness the brutality inflicted on her little boy. Her decision to do this paid off because it was the catalyst for a number of protests around the country. The government had no choice but to issue an arrest for Carolyn Donham, her then-husband Roy Bryant, and her brother-in-law J.W. Millam in connection with Till's abduction. But this is the point where things took a twist. The county sheriff, despite the warrant being made public, did not pursue Donham, claiming her whereabouts were unknown. On the other hand, Bryant and Millam faced a murder trial but were acquitted by an all-white jury. Seven months later, they confessed to killing Emmett Till in a magazine interview yet still weren't indicted. April 2023, Carolyn died of cancer at the age of 88. But in this memoir she wrote before her demise, she claimed not to have recognized Emmett and didn't know the fate that awaited him for her false claims. And number one. Susan Lorenz June 2, 2023, 58-year-old Lorenz fatally shot a Nigerian woman based in Florida named Ajike Owens through her apartment's front door. This incident unfolded after Owens, a 35-year-old mother of four, 
repeatedly knocked on Lorenz's door on that said day. Owens had come to her apartment after learning that Lorenz had taken one of her son's tablets, thrown it on the ground, cursed at him, and flung a pair of roller skates at him. But before she shot at Owens, Lorenz made several calls to the police, lodging complaints about Owens, her children, and other neighbors in the past. Now, her allegations ranged from trespassing and noise disturbances to being called a Karen by the kids. So to prove she wasn't one, I guess she had to murder Owens. Now, to clarify why the cops never acted on Susan's claims of trespass, well, her trespassing claims were false and didn't even pertain to her property. Lorenz also admitted to using racial slurs, including the N-word, when referring to Owens' children, which on its own is a crime. On August 2022, a video shows her voicing her concerns to deputies, saying that she didn't want to endure intimidation, shouting, name-calling, and being labeled a Karen by the kids. She also mentioned that the noise was exacerbating her migraines and affecting her concentration. But in reality, every other neighbor argued that these kids were never causing any harm or problems. On top of all this, Susan tried convincing police deputies that Owens had assaulted her by striking her with a sign. But in reality, again, Owens never hit her with anything, and she would fall to the ground like a typical soccer player Karen. It took a few protests for the cops to finally arrest this person. But even when they did, they didn't charge her with murder, claiming that there wasn't sufficient evidence for this. She was charged with manslaughter with a firearm, culpable negligence, battery, and two counts of assault, meaning she'll be looking at 30 years behind bars. But will she be found guilty of all these charges? Let's watch and see.